Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. And this morning, we're going to talk about a food co-op. It's called Renaissance Community Cooperative. We're going to talk about the eight years that organizing this co-op, opening it up, operating it, and then closing it. Doesn't happen, these closing doesn't happen that often. And we have Mr. Ed Whitfield and Sonia Black. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Good to be on your show again. It, it's a pleasure to have both of you on, and uh, what I would like to do is really talk about organizing this food co-op in the first segment and going into the second segment, talking about how you open it and operated it, and then the sec- the third and fourth segment, we can talk about what happened to cause it to close down and what lessons were, were learned that you all learned from it. So Great. Why, why don't we start off by just how did this ha- start, and how did you all get involved in organizing this food cooperative? Well, there was a community in Greensboro, North Carolina, that in 1998 had lost a Winn-Dixie store that had operated there for years and years. And when that store closed, the people in the community were concerned, so much to the point that they organized a demonstration in the snow in December 1998 to protest their store's closing and hope that it would stay. Well, that didn't work. (laughs) So for years, uh, they put together a community organization called the Concern citizens of Northeast Greensboro, kind of for the purpose of trying to regain a grocery store, hoping that the city government or local developers or somebody would help them do it if they remained kind of organized as a community working on it. And they worked on it for, oh, from 1998 to 2010, 11, and still didn't have a grocery store. So the organization I'm with, the Fund for Democratic Communities, had been advocating and working towards developing cooperative enterprises themselves. And we approached the people from the community and said, why don't you open your own grocery store as a co-op? And naturally their response was, well, we don't know how to do that. How would we do that? Where would we get the money? And it's like, well, we can help you with those things. We can help you find out ways to get the money. We can help you figure out what to do. And we began by taking people on a field trip. You want to talk about that, Johnny? Sure. Um, we went to a co-op in Burlington, North Carolina, that was um, roughly 30 miles away from here, in a smaller town in Greensboro called Company Shops Market. And there were about 30 people total that went on that trip with us. And we went, we wanted to tour the store. The store was larger than the one that we eventually had, but we wanted to give people the opportunity to see what a co-op could look like, what their grocery store, community-owned grocery store could look like. So we took two van loads of people. We went over to Burlington, North Carolina. We toured the store. We um, had lunch with the the chair of the board and some other board members and had some conversations, asked some questions. And uh, the feedback we got was interesting. People liked the store. Um, They did, when they looked at the products, because the, the the products in company shop market were the traditional products in co-op grocery stores. They were organic and natural products, and that's kind of the higher end. Mm-hmm. People in this community wanted fresh produce, fresh meat, and dairy products at an affordable price. Their focus was not organic necessarily. As a matter of fact, they were very aware of not you know, having the prices so high that people in the community would not feel a sense of ownership shopping at the store. So they liked the store. Uh, listening to the board talk about it, they felt like if these folks can do it, just regular everyday people can do it, then we can do it too. So they were inspired and encouraged, and we came back and began having community meetings. Uh, first, there were just you know a handful of people 
But eventually more and more people began, began to come to the community meetings and attend the community meetings. We um, even had some cheerleaders, some champions, a couple of folks that really caught on to the idea that uh, embraced it wholeheartedly and were able to go back and talk about it with people at their churches and people in the community. So they became proponents and, and champions of the project itself. Yeah, I just want to add, a lot of people didn't know what kombucha was. <laughs> and, uh, we saw several different varieties of kombucha in the other store. And we assured them if they opened their own grocery store, they could decide what would be in it. And it did not have to have kombucha. Yep, I like kombucha, but it doesn't like me. I don't, my body doesn't like <laughs> fermented foods, uh, but uh, the enzymes that help with digesting kombucha is good. It's great. And they have a choice to say we can have it or not have it. Okay. Exactly. What, exactly. what year did you go to visit the community uh, shop market in Burlington? What year was that? 2012. Okay. Now, one of the things I like to note is that when the group got back and started meeting, what I really appreciate them was that at one meeting, this lady said, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to have to put something into it ourselves. We didn't have to prompt that response. And she put a $20 bill down on the table and said, you know, let's do this. And passing the hat was one of the regular activities of the community gatherings that took place. So this whole uh, uh the whole formation of this grocery store was rooted in people's sense of um, of self-reliance and the desire to do things for themselves and the confidence that they would be able to do some things for themselves if they had a little help. I also want to point out that most people have never heard of a co-op grocery store except, again, for the types of uh, co-ops that were kind of an exclusive. So some people thought that co-op meant expensive, white neighborhood weird food store. And so when we talked about the fact that no co-ops mean community ownership, that this is your store for it to have the nature and the character that you want. Some people have been apprehensive about the idea that someone was going to try to locate a, what I would call a ghetto store in their neighborhood, something that specifically has low-end products catering to poor people with all the prejudices that have to do with stores that mainly have drug paraphernalia, beer, cigarettes, and wine. And it's like, we don't want that. We don't want that stigma in our community. And I think, was if you build your own store, it can be what you want it to be. Uh, so this store, even when it opened, never had cigarettes in it. Uh, it did have a beer and wine selection. It was pretty nice. And it got to be that the people in the community were involved in deciding the product mix uh, that went into the store. So they had not heard of co-ops. They thought it was expensive, white, and weird. And I had heard that that co-ops, uh, particular food co-ops, were white hippies and tofu. That was what, there. You go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, tofu and kombucha. <laughs> okay. So this was the early part of the process, and we ended up with a steering committee well before we got around to having a board. The steering committee over time kind of morphed into uh, development of a board, the development of bylaws, um, and the, the serious efforts at finding the resources and technical expertise required to, to organize a store. Um, it was several years of work, and some people had gotten promises from other people who wanted – the city owned the site. I need to clarify that. The city owned the site and had a lot to say about what would ultimately be developed there. And at the point that it became clear that the city might be interested in making the site available to this community group, there were other people that quickly came forward with their own proposals about, well, give it to us. We can make some money. And it's like, <laughs> give it to us. We'll have, uh, you know, black participation. And there were some pretty seedy um characters that came forward looking for, um, for you know, a gift of hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of property, which the um, Strip Shopping Center was. Again, I want to point out this was a working class black community um, with a range of people in it, all the way from people living in public housing to people who were, were university professors uh, and city council members. Um, but 
I think what would overall characterize it was it was a working class community, of overwhelmingly African American community. There were some white residents in it. There were some Hispanic residents in it. Overwhelmingly black. And as we began talking to people in the food co-op movement, there were people who told us that this community was too black, too poor, and too uneducated to have a food co-op. And we rejected that out of hand and, in fact, were incredibly upset about the idea that, uh, that we would be told that. And we persisted, and the community held together on that and moved toward the establishment of the store. Are you saying that people in the food co-op movement, people that have already either started food co-ops or were helping in technical assistance or helping with uh, scholarship money or grants, they said that the neighborhood was too black, too poor, and too uneducated? Absolutely. This is, you know, this was the first of its kind, and I say the first of its kind, um, to get as far as it did and to open, absolutely. But yes, traditionally food co-ops were, as you and Ed mentioned, traditionally white. They had organic and natural products. The price point was pretty high, and so that's what people were accustomed to. So to hear here is this working class African American community that was going to open a food co-op, a grocery store in their own neighborhood, was not the norm. Yeah, and pre, uh, folks pretty much dismissed it out of hand. What they might have said was, "Well, we don't know how to do that. That's not within our experience because most of the stores we open, and again, many of the food co-ops that are existing today successfully were opened in the 1970s." when organic and natural food was not readily available. So that was the niche in which they entered the, the market. Had they said, we don't have experience with that, but we'll share all that we know and help you do it, that would have been one thing. Rather than that, there was actually an explicit formulation that communities like the one I just described had what they described as weak demographics. Now, it's a rough thing to go into a neighborhood and tell the people who live there that your demographics are weak. It's like, and so I wouldn't do it. I explained to folks that we were going to do this and try to figure out a way to make it work. And again, we, we, we did, we got a lot, a lot further than people ever assumed that we would be able to, um, without much help and assistance from the existing movement. I will like to say that in the time since that, Many of the people who were offering those sentiments early on have changed their mind, apologized for it, and are now looking to find ways to help grocery stores and the kind of communities that we're talking about succeed as cooperatives. Um, but it did take a lot of work and effort and uh, some people having to admit that, oh, you know, there was a, a blind spot, a somewhat racist blind spot that we had about the realm of possibilities. And so right now there are people who are continuing to work. Many of the communities in the country that are trying to open cooperatives are just like the one that we worked in. Well, I went because to the, the niche of natural and organic food has been largely filled by all kinds of people. I mean, Harris Teeter, Walmart, Food Line, Piggly Weekly, everybody has a section of organic and natural food. So that's no longer the rarity that it once was. And people in communities that are identified as food deserts are certainly all across the country and looking for things that they can do for themselves, for which cooperative solutions would be ideal. Ideal. So we, we're going to take our first break, Ed and Shani. Okay, we'll be right back and we'll talk more about the opening and getting it started. is power. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Co-op. Information is power, and this is why WOL is a great, great um, partner to be doing this show, to give you information about co-ops. And I'm getting a lot of information from Ed Whitfield and Sony Black from the Fund for Democratic uh, Communities in opening up a food co-op in Greensboro, North Carolina. 
So you said to us, Ed, that um, some people in the food cooperative said it was the neighborhood was too black, too poor, too uneducated. It had weak demographics. And they they came back and apologized and said that there was a a racist blind spot, and they apologized for that. They've changed their mind, and now when I went to the up-and-coming conference this past year in Milwaukee, uh, Flint, Michigan was in the house starting a food co-op, Detroit, Michigan. And so I assume that particularly I'd, I'd visit the Detroit location. It's in that same kind of area, same kind of neighborhood in Detroit. So it's changed. <laughs> Absolutely. Food co-ops in communities like the RCC, that's the growing edge of the co-op industry now, as Ed was saying, because so many um, food outlets carry organic products now. Walmart, Kroger, you know, you have the smaller places, the smaller shops, all these even has organic products. They're everywhere. So people can get those products at places that they're shopping all the time. They don't have to make a special trip to um, the natural food stores. They can get them at places where they're getting bargains and get their tires rotated and that kind of thing. So, yes, that is the growing edge in the the co-op industry now, the food co-op industry now, is co-ops in communities like the RCC. And I want to say something else, too. Yes, those folks, those consultants that, that dismissed the project initially, they did come back and apologize. They did not quite use the verbiage that you did. and talked about it being racist, but they did come back and apologize. And I know for me, one of the first learnings, one of the first lessons in this process was because of the word co-op, especially if it's associated with food, people do tend to think of the natural and organic stores. So my assumption would be that middle-aged and younger people, because they were familiar with those food co-ops, would they would be the, the, the folks that would gravitate to this project initially in large numbers. Instead, it was middle-aged and older people. And I believe that's because these people could remember a time when the only way that, that many of us in African-American communities had businesses were if we had them collectively and cooperatively. If we pooled our resources and opened up stores and businesses that met our needs because of racism, they weren't allowed to get loans from traditional lending sources. Okay. Got it. So how long did it take you all to open? When when did you open the store? When did that happen? In 2016. We had our grand opening, a two-day grand opening celebration in November of 2016. And we began work with the community 2011-2012. So five, six years to get us to get it started. Yes. And and that's traditional. That is a traditional timeline in um, the food co-op business. And that was difficult because there were people, this community had been, um, and still is in some ways, a marginalized community. They were under-resourced. So they had been without a grocery store in their area for almost 20 years. So when this came down the pike and this possibility came onto the radar, there were a lot of people that were impatient. They wanted it yesterday. You know, the, the idea that we may have to work for years, gathering our resources, putting the money together. Again, co-ops are about people. So even getting that, that base, we had a goal to have 1,000 members before the store opened. And the idea and the thinking behind that was, number one, there are resources in this community and there are monetary resources. So we wanted 100 people to become, I'm sorry, 1,000 people to become an owner by paying $100. And that, that was a one-time fee to become a member of the co-op. So we felt like if we could get 1,000 people to put up $100 and get some skin in the game, that would be significant. Number one, it would remind people, people in this community and outside of this community, that this community does have resources, that their demographics are not weak, quote unquote. But also, it would leverage, we would be able to leverage that to get money for the project but also for future projects as well. So we did envision the RCC, the co-op as being an economic engine for that community. So 1,000 members at $100 each is $100,000. 
That's correct. So you're trying to get that in as sort of skin in the game, and then we can take that 100000 and maybe borrow and, or get a million or two or three or some form that starting this, I can get more money. Exactly right. And that was pretty much the case. We didn't quite get up to our 1,000 members prior to the store opening. We got to there shortly afterwards. Uh, in fact, we got to... 1,300 members shortly after the store was open, uh, 1,300 members. Uh, that meant that was $130,000 as part of the kitty. And we were able to attract individual investors and financial institutions, particularly ones that specialize in financing cooperatives. So shared capital cooperative out of Minnesota that had been North Country Co-op Development Fund uh, was part of it. The working world out of New York, helped us with aggregating some individual investors who came from, you know, wealthy individuals with money. We had webinars. We explained to them what the community was trying to do. And we had some support from our own foundation, the Fund for Democratic Communities, and other individuals who were willing to make member loans to the effort. Altogether, we had to raise just over $2.5 million for that store before it was able to open. After that, we had to continue to raise money because it was not making money at the rate that we were hoping it would, and had to continue to infuse money into it. But uh, the opening of it was about $2.5 million of funds generated through uh, grants. Some local churches made some grants available, $50,000 from each of two different local uh, churches. And the the city government put in $250,000 as a forgivable loan and help with the financing. But yeah, we're talking two and a half million dollars that took to open a grocery store. And that hundred and thirty thousand dollars that ultimately came from the community was really, really important in arguing to other people that this was something important and it wasn't simply a charitable operation, but it was really an uh, opportunity for the community to do something for itself. So you almost had a half a million dollars with forgivable loan from the city and uh, what the community put in at a hundred dollars each. The thirteen hundred of folks, and then two churches at a fifty thousand each is a hundred thousand. So you got four hundred eighty thousand yeah. right there. It is so, yes. So that's like one. Is that four hundred eighty? Then you need two. That's one fifth. That's twenty percent of what you need. Right. Okay. So, and that's not what the fund put in. <clears throat> no, no, that doesn't include uh, foundation any foundation grants in the part you're talking about. Um, then you're talking about about half a million dollars almost from shared capital as a loan. Uh, you're talking about another half a million dollars or so as a very patient uh, loan through investors that worked through the working world uh, out of New York. And so those are the big pieces of money. Um, the rest of it largely came from some foundation support that came from the Fund for Democratic Communities. We had hoped that other foundations, including the local Community Foundation would make grant money available. The Community Help Foundation helped us secure a loan for fifty thousand uh, dollars for someone to do some of the organizing work for a period of time. There were crowdfunding campaigns that uh, were national and international in the scope. Uh, we have so constantly we picked up a few members to the RCC halfway around the world. But people who on seeing a community trying to do something for itself wanted to be a part of it and wanted to support it. So, uh, but RCC, when you say RCC, that's Renaissance Community Cooperative. That is correct. And R- yes. I, I just wanted to let everybody know I became a member. <laughs> I put my $100 in. I wanted to see this thing succeed because of everything you just talked about. Uh, me, me too. <laughs> yes. Everybody wanted to see this succeed. It did not. And when we, I want to talk about the less how what was going on in the operations now you you've got it open uh, November of 2016 was it yes so you open the doors it was a pretty space the 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 uh the mall is pretty is new is nothing run down is well painted good parking uh so from a physical plan it looked great the shoving, everything looked good. I even ate lunch there. The food was good. The They had a blackberry cobbler that I just couldn't eat. I wanted to. Boy, that thing looked good. But anyway, <laughs> so everything looked like it ought to operate, it ought to function. So let's talk about the 
you got it open now. So the next part is how was the operation and what was those monthly P and L's like? I'm going to say that, but first off, Brent, I want to tell you how much we appreciate the fact that you and others like you uh, had faith in this as a possibility, appreciated it, helped support it. You came to visit, you ate at the store. I'm not exactly sure if I was around when you were there visiting, but I'm glad you told me about it since then. And I'm, I'm really glad you did. And and I appreciate what you're saying now. That it was a very nice store in a nice location, in a community. Uh, with nice parking, and it was Ed, pretty. Ed, I'm sorry, but we got to take our next break. I didn't. I don't. I don't want to stop you, but we got to take our next break, and we'll be right back. News Talk, 1450 AM, WOL, 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative with Mr. Ed Whitfield and Sony Black, who's on the line with us from Greensboro, North Carolina. They are with the Fund for Democratic Communities, and they have been working for and with Renaissance Community Cooperative, a food co-op in Greensboro. So we were just talking about and getting into the operations of this food co-op, and it did close, unfortunately. But let's talk about the operations here for a few minutes. How okay, was that? The first thing I want to say is that it was challenging to find a manager for the store. And while that's crucial is grocery stores operate on razor-thin cash margins. By that, I mean that while the rate of return on investment might be similar to other businesses, the actual margin on cash flow through the store is is really, really thin, sometimes around the neighborhood of 1%. So unless your cash management is almost perfect, unless you're ordering an inventory and control of something called shrink, that's the loss of product due to everything from it aging out to somebody walking out with it. Anything that takes away the product and doesn't allow it to be sold. Unless your management of all of that is near perfect, you'll end up losing money. If your management of it can be perfect, then grocery stores, like anything else, can be money makers. But again, you have to have very skilled managers that know how to run this business. In the two and a half years that the store was open, we went through four managers. Oh, my God. None of them were completely adequate to run the store. The best one was someone who came in in an interim position and really wasn't even going to stay there. We weren't expecting her to. Um, Still had some challenges in working with the staff and working with the community, even though she did a better job and tried to put systems in place. The last one kind of at some point bombed out. And, you know, I, I say this recognizing people may even be listening, but I will assure you that we never quite had the quality of managers that we needed in order to do this. And I offer that as a caution to people who are working on similar projects. That one of the things that you want to do is be very, very careful in your manager selection. And the challenge you're going to have is that the pool of, of potential managers is really small. Um, we had wanted an African-American manager, and except for a brief interim period where some people from inside the store tried to work toward running the store, um, the managers were white that came into the community. Why? Because we weren't looking for some really highly qualified black managers, but evidently if there are such people, they're already working at corporate stores that can afford to pay them much more than we could afford to pay. So you, you have to figure out that you're going to pay a bunch of money to whoever's going to be the manager, and even then it's going to be challenging to find somebody with all of the skills that are needed to do this successfully. There are challenges that existed in in marketing. Our assumption had been We had this field of dreams assumption, quite frankly. If you build it, they will come. They will come. That only works in movies, it turns (laughs) out. (laughs) It does not work with grocery stores, particularly in a community where for 18 years people have found some other place to buy groceries. And the reason I know that is because not everybody starved to death, which meant they were eating for the whole time. Yep. So what you got to do is have some plan that's going to shift people from the existing patterns. And again, people are pattern actors. Uh, we had a guy who was incredibly invested in the store. 
he he was for a, a significant period of time. For most of the time, the show was there. He was the chair of the board, and he told me that he would get up in the morning and uh, and go and start running to the grocery, driving to some other grocery store he had shopped at for eighteen years, and then forget and have to turn around and say, "Oops," and turn around and come back to the to the uh, Renaissance Community Cooperative. Again, patterns are ingrained. So you would need some marketing that was able to help shift people's buying habits. And then the other thing that we were talking about is movement building. You need a supportive community that consistently is working toward helping people shift their buying habits and recognizing the importance of communities doing things for themselves. Because while indeed that grew out of our history, it isn't, our, it isn't much of our contemporary reality. So right now, everybody is expecting some other corporate entity to lay on the table in front of them and also lay out for them hundreds of Internet and newspaper and radio and television ads telling them where they should go buy things and where they should even go to spend money that they don't want to spend, don't need to spend to buy things that they don't want. This is what goes on hourly every day. And so you have to, within all that noise, create a signal that tells people and they'll go here and, in fact, build a movement around it. So while we were able to build a store, we didn't quite succeed. We didn't recognize the, the, the immensity of the task, nor quite succeed at building the kind of movement around it. We were leaning in that direction. We wanted to do it. We wanted to see this, again, as Shani mentioned, as an engine for potential further growth, as an example of other possibilities of the community doing things for itself. So we recognize that need. We didn't quite succeed in building that level of movement around it. We did not, in the beginning, put uh, make available the kind of resources for the level of marketing that was needed. In fact, one of the people who was a manager, one of the early managers of the store, told me, well, I'm not worried about marketing. People don't have any other choice. This is the only grocery store in the area. No, and I guess so he forgot true. about the fact that yeah. people bought groceries somewhere else for 18 years. Yeah, so not true. Well, when I came down, it was uh, to hear Reverend Barber speak at a church, and I think it was Shallow Baptist Church, and Al Gore was there to speak in Greensboro. And so okay. I stopped in the store, had lunch, talked to the then manager for about an hour, found out how things were going. I think he may have been the last guy because he came out of California and he was talking about some of the issues that they were having there. So when I told him why I was there and I'm going, are you going to be there? Or do you have flyers to pass out there? You having all of these people in Greensboro, the church was overwhelmingly packed, but there was no presence for RCC. And I was sort of like, there's an opportunity missed here to, to promote yes. this and not very expensively in, in making flyers. So, so yeah, I, I'm not necessarily a good promoter, but I understand marketing since I taught it for five years at Howard and I took a lot of classes in it and I'm going, okay, how do you, how do you simply put together marketing programs? When I say simply in, inexpensively, particularly when you have a, a, something like this and looking for those kinds of events would be one of the things that you would want your promotions person or your marketing or your manager to be looking at of how to drive business into the store. Um, absolutely. You, you're absolutely right, Vernon. Um, so marketing and, and operations, some of those things are, are what we consider to be hard skills. And as Ed was talking about, finding skilled management for co-op grocery stores is tremendously challenging, but there's a set of skills that we refer to as soft skills as well. So some of what you're talking about, thinking about, okay, where do I need to, to promote the store? knowing about the events that are going on in the community that you need to be connected with. And, you know, with a lot of stores, it's specifically, yes, in the African-American community. You know, with, with traditional stores, again, I'm thinking big box stores, Walmart, Paris, Peters, Kroger's, they have national marketing campaigns that come out of their national office. Mm -hmm. So you as a manager in a small store in Greensboro, you don't have to worry about that. That's taken care of. You don't have to have any experience with that. That's not even part of your thinking. But again, those skills are, are necessary for a store like this, a small community-owned store that there is no home office. 
to design your marketing campaign, to roll out the commercials. That's something you've got to do yourself. So that's another challenge is, is finding management that has both the hard skills to operate the store effectively and efficiently and the soft skills to be able to connect with the community, specifically the community that the store is in. And I, I and I've I've thought about this a lot for both restaurants and grocery stores is managing that shrinkage that Ed talked about. It, it's like, how do you do that? I mean, so that because you look at all of the different products that you have and a bunch of them have dates on them that they expire after blah, blah, blah. So it's like I could be better at trying to make sure that the food isn't taken and walked out of the store not being paid but I'm not even sure I have the skills to do that very well. So, yeah, finding somebody to have those skill sets, I guess that would be the number one challenge. Absolutely. And, again, you know, with big box stores, you've got home office. So you've got somebody who is crunching the numbers for you. They're sending reports back to you, telling you what those numbers mean, and then they're also telling you what to do about it. With co-op, you are the home office. You have to have that set of skills yourself and be able to do that. Wow. Okay. So none of the organizations, the Umbrella Food Co-op organizations can help in that area. I know they've talked about uh, training managers, but this whole marketing piece and shrinkage piece, I guess that's not being, that's not happening anywhere in this world, in this co-op world yet. Yes. Um, there are some, some organizations. Um, there's Columinate, which is a uh, cooperative of consultants in the grocery industry. Um, they do offer training, and Ed mentioned to you one of the um, managers we had at the store who was the best of all of the managers we had. She came from that organization. There's also FCI, the Food Cooperative Initiative, and they offer support and some training to start up co-ops as well. So there are some people that are out there doing this, but again, our communities are unique. Relationships mean everything in our communities now. Again, when you've got the big box stores that you don't have to think about it, you've seen the commercials, you're getting the coupons in your email, you know, they can even afford to give away free food. Some of these big box stores in town, the super stores, they have commercial, I mean, they have coupons that come to your inbox and they, they're literally giving away food. Um, of course, a small store like ours cannot afford to give away, give away food. We did accept coupons but we couldn't give it away. So those are some of the challenges that are out there. But again, developing or finding someone that has those soft skills to be able to identify with the culture and the people in our community. And it's not a monolith. I'm not trying to say all African-Americans are the same or all African-American communities are the same, but there are some touchstones and some ways that, that, that we relate with each other that are unique. And you have to find a manager that is aware of that or can, is open to learn that and then be able to excel at that. And that's another lever that you use to get people into the store. So it really requires a level of skill on the one hand and humility on the other, because you got to be willing to learn a lot of stuff. And some of our folks who are where they had skills, they lack humility or where they had humility, they lack skills. Anyhow, we never quite got it all together. Got it. Well, we talked about the manager, and I, there's a lot of other people in the store, and I noticed that the there was a couple of people at the cash register, and I talked a couple of people back in the deli where they, they made the food, the, the hot foods in that, that area. And the one lady at the cash register, extremely friendly, extremely helpful, went out of her way to, to answer any question, anything. So I thought, that's great. It was the same thing with getting the food back there. I mean, like I was asking questions like, you know, how much sugar you have in this? What do you put salt in it? Just totally answered my questions. It was it felt great. So it, th has that been an issue also or is it at, just at the manager level? And how is it with other employees? The truth of the matter is that there was a lot of training required for employees. At the same time, what you said is true. People accepted that training and did very well. One of the successes of the store, in spite of the fact that the store closed, is that for a period of a couple of years, this was stable employment for between 17 and 30 people. We're, we're taking our final and break. Ed, I'm sorry. We're going to take our final break and come right back to that because 17 to 30 people employment. We'll be right back. News Talk, 1450 AM. 
You know, the National Cooperative Bank sponsors this program. They've been doing it now for almost six years. This October co-op month will be six years we've been doing this program. And we normally always talk about the pluses of a co-op, of running a co-op, and how when Ed started talking of the benefits to the community, we just ended by talking about the training of people, and they had uh, full-time employment, steady employment for two and a half years, 17 to I don't know if you said 20 or 30, Ed. 30. 30. So this yeah, is between what I, 70 and 30. Between 17 uh, and 30 people. Now, I want to talk more about the operation, but we got to talk about your closing, uh, the store, eventually what caused the close, and lessons learned, and some of the lessons we've already talked about. Yeah, and it won't take long to tell why we had to close. Yeah. We had to close because it wasn't making any money. And not only was it not making any money, it wasn't trending upward. Had it been a situation where we were beginning to make money, beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel and just need to hold on a little longer, then we would have been able to hold on a little longer, draw in additional resources that would be required to buy the time to do that. But we haven't said anything about the board. I, w- I, I want to say some things. I want to say nice things about our board members. Okay. There was a board elected, and it went through several different annual elections, and new board members came on. And people worked really, really hard at trying to make this work and were invested in it in a way that it was painful to them uh, for the store to close. And one of the kinds of questions that they were raising when it became clear that there, we were not moving in the right direction and we needed to make a decision in order to be able to close the store with dignity as opposed to falling apart, which is one of the ways you can, you can, you can do one of these disaster closings where everybody just gets left out. You know, you find out tomorrow you have no job, there's no severance. Um, the creditors are hounding everyone, you know, the bad. No, we didn't, want, we didn't want to go out like that. So we wanted to be able to close with dignity. And there were people saying, well, you know, maybe we can raise a little extra money uh, like, like the college had to do, like Bennett College had to do, and just say, oh, how much more do we need? How much more time do we need? And my answer was, if you're going in the wrong direction, then however much time you have is going to be enough because going down won't get you back up. Not like going around the globe where east will get you west eventually. This is like you're losing money. And we actually had negative gross margin, which, again, it goes back to this question of controlling shrink and identifying the correct price points and other things. And with negative gross margins, that means that the more food you sell, the worse uh, the off you more are. Money you lose. And uh, that's that's not good. We were not able to go in the right direction. After the store opened, there was a brief period of time when sales were trending up. Then it flatlined and began trending downward. And we never fully reversed that. So what I'm hearing you say is that when it started, at some point you had more and more sales. So it was going up. Then it flatlined that you were doing the same amount of sales, maybe month on month on month. And then your sales started dropping off. You started dropping off or staying flat for a period and then dropping again or a slight uptick for one sales period and then three or four sales periods with it going down again. And you you have the optimists in the world who will look at it, you know, it goes up a hundred dollars, then it drops 400 and they say, it's just going up and down. Mm. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> nope, you, you got to look at the long-term trend here. The store is losing money. And so the reason it closed is because it never got its revenues where they needed to be in order to be a sustainable store. And after the two and a half million dollars I was saying it took to open the store, we put in another million and a quarter uh, trying to keep it afloat that came out of philanthropic resources, very honestly, because we did want it to succeed. But there were some conditions that were required for it to see, and that included being able to turn around sales, get the gross margins to be positive, and just jack up the revenues or begin to have the revenues trending upward, and we couldn't quite do it. Um, And again, those three M's between management, marketing, and building the sufficient movement within the community, we were not able to succeed. Even Again, the success of it was 17 to 30 people with a job many of whom would describe that as the best job they had ever had, many of whom have never, have not since then been able to find a job that is as satisfying on the one hand 
and is lucrative in pay. We we made a point of pay, paying people above average wages, and again, it wasn't the high wages that damaged the store. I mean, we didn't want a store that was going to pay people slave wages and call it a success. That's a success for whom? So mm -hmm. the beginning pay in the store is like ten dollars an hour. There were some people with more skills and more responsibilities that made up with the, I guess, sixteen, seventeen dollars an hour. We tried to pay the manager what was required in the sixty grand, uh, an area of sixty thousand dollars a year, and I mean those wages are moderate. I had somebody complain to me one time. Yeah, but it's still not a living wage, and I told her like, okay, where's the money supposed to come from? I mean, this is not. This isn't some charitable thing from rich people that can decide how much money they want to give folks. This is an opportunity for a community to do something for itself. And it's got to, in the final analysis, be self-sustaining, or else it's, it is a charity. You know, if it requires ongoing subsidy forever and ever, then it needs to have another reason to exist. Maybe you do it as a jobs program, realizing that it's not really a business, but it's a training opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, have we looked at it that way, then it succeeded. But it was a business. It was trying to be a business. It was trying to be sustainable. It wanted to be a model of how to do this. And even in its failure, I think there were some things that were learned from it, ought to be instructive to other people doing similar things. And hopefully it can serve as a lesson in that way and still have some utility. Is there any possible way of starting it back again? Well, Vernon, that's up to the community. You know, again, we kind of circle back to where we began with co-ops or about communities and individuals meeting their needs. And that's that's how the co-op, that's how the RCC came into being and to existence. This community had been without a grocery store for almost 20 years and they wanted a grocery store. So if the community decided that they want to have tried again and give it a shot, um, I'm sure there will be support for them now. Now that they've done, even though the store has closed, okay, there are still people that um, are very supportive of the effort are heartbroken as we were that it didn't work. And I think there can be some support out there for, you know, going forward if folks want to give it another try. So anything is possible. I understand that the city owned the shopping center. Was the rents uh, sort of a, a good rents? Were they uh, too much that could be afforded? Was the space, was the box of the store too big? I mean, was there any way the of city lowering that down? Yeah, the city initially owned the space and sold it with some subsidies to Self-Help Ventures Fund. Uh, so help, Self-Help Credit Union, which is a large CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, that does some uh, work in communities across the country, mainly in the South, but more and more in other parts of the country as well. I think it is the largest community development uh, financial institution in the whole country has several billion dollars in assets. So that was the ultimate owner of the of the, uh, the center space and ended up setting the rents. And while the rent was at a higher amount than we wanted to pay, which is not unusual, mm -hmm. I think everybody's rent they ever charged me was always too high. Yeah. <laughs> but that wasn't that wasn't the completely decisive factor. Okay. Um, it should have been possible to own a store. They they were charging commercial rent rates in the area. And so the store is going to be sustainable and not um, subsidized. Then the rent rate they charged was about the right thing. It could have been a little lower, I think, but that, that wasn't the, the a sole key factor. I would think that in general, uh, expenses going into rent and financing, which ultimately go into people who own property and provide mortgages, which means it's ultimately going back to the banks, that is one of the ways that community resources are sucked out of the community and back into the financial arena. Um, but it wasn't so much so, it wasn't that way distinct from other similar spaces and businesses that people might run. So that's a longer discussion I'd like okay. to have at some point on the relationship between uh, the world of finance and, and, um, and property ownership and the challenges that it means for business development. We should do that one later. Yep, I, I would like to do that. That's that's why I brought it up about, I, I wasn't wondering if there's a way of buying the shopping center in a way that could lower the rents and therefore coming back might be a way of uh, helping to to sustain something with, you said the three, the three M's, management, marketing, and movement. 
uh, I got the other one, other, I'm going to call it a fourth one, that's margins, um, uh, managing. I'll go with that. Yeah. Uh, getting those yeah. markets, margins correct, uh, which also would include uh, minimizing the shrinkage so that you. Minimizing shrinkage, reducing yeah. rent and other kinds of uh, peripheral payments that had to be made as well. Yeah. Yes. So what would you like to leave people with, sir and lady? What kind of overall message would you like to leave people with? Don't like get into co-ops, get into co-ops. What would you like to do? I'd like to, I'm going to do a Don Cornelius. I want to leave people with peace, love, and happiness. All right. But as it relates to co-op produce, <laughs> this effort does not represent the failure of cooperative movements and communities. It is an effort that, like other efforts, helped to reveal the difficulties it uh, taught us some lessons. Hopefully these lessons can be shared and employed by others to be more successful and go well beyond the, the extent that we were able to, to move this. That, that's how things happen. Someone said, we, we fight, we fail, we fight, we fail until we succeed. Okay. And um, we, we, so hopefully we've learned something from this that will help us move toward the successes that are sure to come in the future. Thank you, sir. We got to go. And we'll look for the future then. Have a great day, everybody. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, 95.9 FM.